Hello and welcome to another episode of 007 Gold. Um, it's a bit of a tradition for YouTubers uh, that uh, follow James Bond films and books and, and games and stuff like that to rank them in order of favourite. I don't bother too much. I've read all the books, uh, all the Fleming books that is, when I was younger and I, I'm not a gamer. I don't do video or computer games at all. Um, I'm far too bad tempered. <laughs> anyway, um, however the films I've seen all of them multiple times um, and what I'm going to do is I will rate them more in order of what I enjoy watching because everybody's got a different view of these movies you know and you know when I do this people are going to say well how could you put that at number 18 and the other one at number 7 when that one's got a better boat chase and so on you know um, basically the order I'm ranking them in is just a personal order of which ones I enjoy putting on just you know to really you know I think that that'll make me feel really happy and all good you know and all that one's most exciting you know um, and there's some that I, I, I barely uh, go to I still watch them now and again sometimes if they're on TV you see the first few minutes and end up watching the entire movie uh, that happens but as far as I've, I have the blu-ray collection and um, there's some of them that just don't get played um, anyway that's the criteria of how they're ranked, uh, how much I actually enjoy them. You can hear click clack noises because my dog uh, Bailey, <laughs> he gets bored when I do this, so you might hear him coming and going in and out of the room, not to worry. He's not much of a Bond fan to be honest now, he prefers the news. Um, anyway, there's it. there he goes. Anyway, let's start. Now, obviously, I can't do number 25 yet because we haven't seen uh, no time to die it's still not being released so we will start with number 24 which is a view to a kill don't hate you know it's just not for me basically and I, with every one of these movies i'll give the reasons why uh at first i think roger moore is basically far too old to play a bond he knew it uh, he said he found it embarrassing, but they basically threw so much money at him and put so much pressure on him, and the fans all asked for more, so he had to do it. But I find the film really dull. It's 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 no fun for me at all. The amount of um, stunt work uh, where you can blatantly see that it's not Roger Moore. Uh, it's just it, the you know it's as if half of the time you see Bond on screen, it's not played by Roger Moore. Uh, I, I'm not keen on the story. It's a kind of a fumbled Goldfinger remake, and uh, no, it's just not for me. Great theme music, and some of the original soundtrack. I'll talk about the soundtracks a lot. Uh, is absolutely great. I mean, it's a wonderful soundtrack. Um, John Barry doing as well as he ever has done, you know. But the movie on the whole, too silly. Uh, no, it just doesn't work. Moving on, so. You'll see me glancing off to the side of the camera as well because I'm looking at me uh, the list, the order that I have them in. Uh, number 23. The Man with the Golden Gun. I really, really do not like this movie. I've never liked it. Uh, there's, As with all Bond films, you know, I, I love Roger Moore. I think he's great. And I like watching him. But that doesn't necessarily mean that every movie that he's in is good. And this one isn't. Uh, I mean, Mary Goodnight's just incredibly annoying. Uh, and she would never, ever work for anything to do with the Secret Service, uh, with the kind of, um, <clears throat> well, I don't know, it's just the kind of personality and the way she, she messes everything up. It's, it's just very poor indeed. Um, I think, yes, some of the scenes filmed on the island are fantastic uh, cinematography-wise. I love uh, everything that Christopher Lee does. He's absolutely brilliant in it. I have no qualms there. But the flying car it looks absolutely horrendous um, when it takes off. Everybody, I mean, infamously, the slide whistle noise when the car does one of the best stunts of the series. It does the loop, um, you know, across the ramshackle bridge. Um, and that's just spoiled by the music, basically. Uh, and I just, it's like 70s, early 70s tat. It's the same time as the poor I carry on movies and the confessions films and stuff like that everything about it just looks and, and even feels really cheap even the music is not one of barry's best and the theme's probably one of the worst 
So that's that. That's number 23. Number 22. Yes, it's Die Another Day, which is quite disliked uh, amongst a lot of Bond fans. Um, it does have its good points. I've got to say, the first... I, I think maybe it's as much as the first quarter of the movie's okay. Um, I think it's all right, right up until uh, the point where they go to Havana and uh, he meets up with Jinx and stuff. Uh, Halle Berry's a great actress, but this character is just so annoying. I mean, really. Uh, no, it, it's... It's not well written at all. Um, I've got to say, to be honest, the car scene, um, the invisible car is bad. There's no doubt about that. I know you can say, well, they're working on that technology now and it could happen and, and so on, you know. I don't know, maybe, maybe it's 50 years down the line, yes, but at the moment it just looked silly. Um, it was just daft, which is a shame because when it, it's not cloaked and invisible, the actual um, car chase on the ice is fantastic. Both cars, the Jaguar and the Aston Vanquish, the weapons they have on board and the way it's filmed is absolutely brilliant. Uh, but then you get terrible scenes following, like, you know, surfing up that tsunami, which is just one of the most awful. In fact, I think basically probably the most awful scene in any Bond film. Um, it's terrible. And the worst CGI that I think most people agree that's ever been put on the screen um awful terrible soundtrack although a lot of the music by david arnold through the movie is really good uh but the um the dying of the day uh, opening theme is just awful i mean it really is bad uh and it's just not a good film at all um even the villain you know at the end of the day that ridiculous electric suit at the end that's supposed to you hug people to electrocute them and that you know I just you know honestly it's just it's too daft for words so for that reason uh, that's why it's right down the list so the next one number 21 yep it's you only live twice and uh, I know a lot of you out there gotta go what um, and I thought this was an absolute classic when I was a kid I mean you know uh, I've got to say I wanted to be Sean Connery more than anything in the world, you know. I wanted to be Sean Connery as Bond more than anything in the world. And um, it's just that I watched it again not long ago because, you know, I'm watching all the Bond movies through again, uh, especially with making this channel. Um, and it doesn't really hold up. You can tell that he's really just so sick of playing Bond now. I know he'd had a terrible time with reporters and stuff and felt he'd been tread awfully... Uh, by the media amongst other people when he was in Japan um, filming this but really you know the, the type of money you were getting and the, the fact that you have so many adoring fans he could have put a bit of a bit more of an effort in he just really all the way through he's just going through the motions that you know when you see something like his performance in From Russia With Love um, where he's really into the character you know there's a world of difference um, and besides, I know it's a silly bit of escapism. Escapism, sorry, it's quite late at night actually. That's and this is totally unscripted. I have no script anywhere. I just speak of the films as I remember them, and I find that's the best way to do it. But um, it's no, the hollowed out volcano, the whole thing. Um, I think probably suffers from being sent up so many times with uh, Austin Powers and, and other movies of that ilk that it's kind of now difficult to take in. Um, you know, you watch it and you think, well, who's built this? <laughs> you know? And where are these hundreds of thousands of people that it would have involved and would have took 20 years? You know, where did they go to and, and how were they paid? And, you know, they don't tell anybody ever, you know, I, I don't know. I know you shouldn't think like that about Bond films. I know, don't, don't, you know, don't tell me off. I know this. But you just can't help it with this one because if it had been done with a little bit more kind of... Um, well, just a bit more effort is the word, I think, to be honest, then it would have been fine. But since he can't be bothered and um, you get really silly scenes and terrible back projection with a little Nelly uh, helicopter fight, you know, the, the battle with the four helicopters could have been one of the greatest. And to be honest, I did a, a, a test thing, um, which I put on YouTube, where I took out all the little snippets of back projection and just had the actual live flying scenes with the Bond theme over and it's better. Um, you know, but at the time, I suppose the movies all did back projection and that was that, you know. Anyway, there we go. Um, again, 
great theme music John Barry an absolute blinding soundtrack all the way through uh, that part of it's fantastic and there's some good acting performances the girls are lovely you know um, but it just doesn't hold up for me I'm, I'm, it's not one that's, uh, that's easy to watch nowadays so that's why it's number 21 so next number 20 yes Quantum of Solace the thing about this film is it's not really a bad film it's not an awful film Daniel Craig is great in it and uh, I think that the, the main problem with it is the way it's been edited it's it's jump cuts all the time so it goes kind of car wheel truck front of car side of car gun truck bond driver and, and it just jumps and jumps and jumps like this where you know after about 15 minutes of this film you've got a blind and headache um, that as well as you know another absolutely awful theme um, you know you can tell the music means quite a lot to me with these movies as well because you know it, it tends to be the ones that I don't like also seem to have awful themes but that's, I don't know whether that's coincidence or whether it, it's you know part of the psyche of the thing for me but um, no the theme's awful um, terrible uh, and uh, the story I don't know it's okay um, it, it continues straight on from Casino Royale a direct sequel um, the start the actual stunts um, at the start which would have been I guess a pre-title sequence if we'd had a gun barrel with this which we don't uh, which again I think they should have had that in fair enough the way they did it in Casino Royale was great but I think for this one they should have brought back the gun barrel at the start instead of having one at the end which was a kind of just a bit of an effort at a gun barrel it wasn't even great um, and just confusing as well I mean you know I think I saw the pictures I came home and I couldn't be bothered to go and see the pictures again because I, I didn't really enjoy it that much and then eventually obviously got the DVD and now I've got the Blu-ray and you know I watched it again I watched them all of them for doing this these reviews uh, and no it's it's not one that I would go to uh, especially it's not awful there's nothing terrible about the acting or terrible about the storyline but it's just a bit unimaginative and um, bad editing as I say uh, that's that's the, the thing for that one so uh, that's enough about that I've had enough about it actually <laughs> so next number 19 Diamonds Are Forever. Strange that I've got this so low actually because this is actually the first Bond film I saw. And um, because I'm getting on in years now, I actually saw it on its release um, in 1971. So I was absolutely blown away then as a child of six years old. Uh, loved it. I, honestly, you know, that got me totally into the Bond. That and the fact that Mark, a good friend of mine, uh, who was three years old, I was already well into all the Bond stuff and. Uh, you know waxing lyrical about it and getting me into all that both all those movies as well you know so when i eventually saw this one oh fantastic you know loved it years later you watch it and you realize how camp it is how daft it is um i mean it just the majority of it just doesn't make any sense you know the the guys are getting plastic surgery to look like blofeld you know the guy at the start that you know in no time does that involve climbing into enormous baths of mud? It, you just don't do that. It has nothing to do with it. It's um, no, it, it's incredibly silly. Um, it's camp all the way through. You know, I mean, not just Mr. Wind and Mr. Kid, but the, the whole feel of the thing, and it's it's kind of tacky Las Vegas as well. You know, um, Bond in America is either great or not good at all. Great in the likes of. Um, Goldfinger, but not great in this and not great in uh, the scenes in A View to a Kill in uh, USA, which is most of the movie. Um, it's it, the acting performances, people are really playing it for laughs. I mean, Sean is, uh, I like him more in this than I do when You Only Live Twice uh, because he seems relaxed and he's relaxed and he's having fun with it, you know. But there are some scenes that are so badly done and again, bad editing as well. I mean, the the moon buggy thing, you know, is, is, is quite ludicrous, to be honest with you. Um, but he escapes in a moon buggy, fair enough. Climbs out of it and it goes away on its own. And then a security guard who's previously been knocked off a bike just sits on the bike, revving it, 
you know, for a ridiculously long time, as if he's just waiting to be kicked off it, basically, because the, the guy doing the editing didn't know what he was doing. Uh, it's just oh, sloppy and a very silly end and very poor. Apparently, though, uh, on the oil rig, I've read that um, a lot of the squibs and major explosions that were supposed to happen on the oil rig all went off by accident and they couldn't film them again, so it's not quite as grand as it was supposed to look. Um, and there were supposed to be scenes of um, helicopters full of American scuba divers to come and help Bond and, you know, attack the oil rig and none of that happened. Um, on the whole, as well, Jill St. John, she's great uh, for the majority of it, but at the end of the film she turns into some kind of, like, ditzy, dumb, um, just, like, sort of person who, who the only, all she can really do is fall off the oil rig. I mean, it's just bad. That's enough about that, anyway. Um... So, loved it when I was a kid, don't love it that much now. And next, number 18. Yes, License to Kill. Um, the thing is, all of these films from now, from this one, right the way to number one, I actually like all of them. Uh, but you've got to put things in, a, a, you know, if you're doing things in an order, you have to have some criteria behind it. And the reason this one rates so low for me, to be honest, is there's a lot of it doesn't feel like a James Bond movie in the classic sense. Um, the soundtrack is very much of, of the style of um, a standard late 80s action movie, you know, like Die Hard, Under Siege, Passenger 57, that type of film. And, and the whole film being a revenge story is a bit like that. There's also some other bits that I just find so weird that I don't know why um, they're actually included. You know, you're in a South American country and at one point you get three ninjas coming out of nowhere and attacking Bond because they're on their own special mission, you know. And you think, well, you know, just dressed in full ninja gear with ninja weaponry and all kinds. And it, I don't know, it just seems weird. It doesn't seem to fit. Um, I don't fault Timothy Dalton at all. I think he's great in it. Uh, and I actually really like the theme tune. A lot of people don't like uh, License to Kill by Gladys Knight. I think it's a great song. Um, good scenes. There's a good uh, massive truck um, chase at the end, you know, with some brilliant stunts and, and it's, it's great stuff. But I don't know, just um, the world of like sort of a really serious heavy drug barons and drug lords and that. And, and it's a very violent film as well, which... I don't have anything against that, you know, I don't mind. Um, but it limits the enjoyment for kids, I think, and it, it doesn't have a lot of humour. It has very little humour in it. It's a little bit of humour when Q's involved and an odd bit with the Reverend. But, you know, on the whole, it's it's a very kind of... It's action-packed, but it's very dour. And, um, you know, I have to rank them some way. And, and this one's just not one that I watch a lot. So, you know, that's uh, that's why it's there. Um, but, you know, again, as I say, a really, really good performance by all the actors, that, you know, and all the characters are good enough. It's just not not um, my favourite, basically. So, Anyway, next we have number 17. Pure shock. Skyfall is so far down the list. I know that's what you're thinking, but, you know, basically, as I say, these are just my personal like sort of um, list of favorites and uh, you know there's a lot of Skyfall which is fantastic um, I think Daniel Craig is absolutely brilliant in it possibly the best performance by him of the four movies that he's made so far I don't know about No Time to Die yet obviously we haven't seen it um, and Javier Bardem uh, as Silva is absolutely fantastic I mean he's probably one of my favorite Bond villains um, so why would I rank it so low well, first off, by the third Bond film, I, uh, you know, a little bit of a bugbear. I really thought by now they should have brought the gun barrel back at the start and they didn't. We still had another kind of half-hearted gun barrel at the end. Um, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is the gaps in the story and plot holes are just enormous. Um, I mean, a prime example is, you know, Bond goes uh, basically... To see uh, a guy that he suspects is going to be assassinated. Now, he kind of watches the assassination and then acts shocked and attacks the assassin. And you think, well, if you wanted more information, stop the assassination 
and then catch the assassin basically but he watches the whole thing go and then acts a bit shocked when he knew that was what was going to happen and i thought that was strange another prime example severin when bond and severin uh, go to silver's island obviously you punish as a punishment um for kind of betraying him silver makes a stand against the wall and her and bond have got to take a pot shot with an old uh, flintlock type gun you know and uh, bond's got a plan of how, how he's going to get out of this you know um but he takes a shot and deliberately misses as you probably know silver just shoots her he kills her basically you know outright and then instantly bond makes a pithy remark and kicks off you know killing all the guards and um taking silver hostage and he's got helicopters due to come why didn't he do that before she was shot you know i mean why why wait until silver shoots her and then do it you know it, it just didn't make any sense to me you know I, I don't understand stuff like that and again the, the biggest one is if if you want to bring the villains to you by leaving as he says a trail of breadcrumbs but breadcrumbs as i say it is late at night um you know and take em to skyfall great excellent idea but you would nip into q branch first and take some of the best weapon you could get your hands on you wouldn't go and then expect to find some rusty old guns that your parents might have left behind before they died you know and with a rusty old gamekeeper there as well who might have a shotgun no you, you would you would say you know right we'll go into q branch we'll get some machine guns we'll get some i don't know what grenades rockets whatever bond wanted to use you know but no we'll go up there with next to nothing and have to make nail bombs out of light bulbs and stuff it just it doesn't ring true to me it doesn't make any sense but on the whole it's a good film um i don't like the skyfall theme i won't pretend i do uh, nothing against adele she's got a good voice but i just don't like it i'm kind of sick of these really maudlin depressing um bond themes you know i'd rather hear something like the uhmss instrumental or um you know my name from casino royale which is fantastic upbeat exciting bond music you know um so that's that anyway that's uh skyfall was number 17 and on to number 16. i know i know you're saying goldfinger how can it possibly be that far down the list um it's just overkill really i think i think i watched it so many times and saw it so many times at the cinema when i was young cinema minimum. cinema nothing to do with cinnamon uh when i was young that basically um it, it, i've kind of done it to death you know um and it, it's one of those where whenever anybody's talking about bond whether they're big bond fans or not it, it's always goldfinger goldfinger and you, you just kind of i'm not saying i'm sick of it but i know it so well that i kind of don't watch it that much anymore um i prefer the ones that have a little bit more espionage about them and stuff you know um it, it, it's a great film soundtrack is is tremendous and the theme is as i'm sure most people agree is probably one of the best um it's it's absolutely marvelous you can't fault the acting from anyone although the choice of felix later i wasn't too keen on uh, on that actor but you know other than that a great movie but um as i say it's it's just so familiar now um that i tend to not really watch it so often if it's on tv and i flick across the channels you know and, it, and it's there then I'll, I'll probably watch it at the end but i don't really go and uh, select it from the uh, collection and watch it very often but uh, still very good but um that was it number 16 so on to number 15 next number 15 octopussy um if i'd made this video a couple of years ago uh octopussy wouldn't have been anywhere near this high it would, probably would have been standing around 19 or 20. but you know it's been pointed out to me over the years look forget about the dressed as a clown thing you know um forget about the elephant noises and the tars and swinging vine stuff and just watch it as a film you know kind of zone out when those bits happening uh and, and you know evaluate it as a movie and you know it really to be honest it's a very good film it's a shame i think they put those silly bits in but that was the style of stuff with roger moore in the uh, in the 80s movies you know and um it, it's actually it's got some very very good scenes and again some brilliant stunts and stuff you know um 
similar to Moonraker, which uh, we'll get to later. Uh, the aerial stuff with the stunt guys on the outside of planes and stuff is absolutely brilliant, you know. Um, Maud Adams is gorgeous. Um, same as she was in Man with the Golden Gun, but we've already established I don't like that movie at all. Um, but she's absolutely lovely in it. And, um, you know, it, 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 it's just a, it's a good film. It has a good soundtrack. Um, All-time high, Rita Coolidge. Not that keen on the theme. It's all right. It's very pleasant, but it's very kind of... Uh, Radio 2 afternoon, you know. Um, but anyway, uh, decent performance by Roger and still looking great. So, you know, it's all right. Um, I don't know. It's definitely gone up in the rankings, but I think number 15 is about as, as high as it would ever get for me. Um, you know, a lot of fun though. So, next, number 14. Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, I like most of this film. I like, you know, I, I, I like it more than dislike it. Put it like that. Michelle Yeoh is great. Uh, the soundtrack is probably one of the best soundtracks of the entire franchise. David Arnold absolutely knocks it out of the park with this one. Uh, tremendous. Very Bondian. Loads of the classic Bond theme in it. And then loads of... Um, the more kind of well not poppy exactly but the slightly more slightly electronic music that uh, that David Arnold mixes with orchestra as well so really great um, choice of car the BMW kind of BMW kind of family saloon I wasn't so sure about the weapon the gadgets in it and weapons are great um, but the car itself is not particularly great to look at although I suppose if you were trying to have an unassuming car because you were a spy, then it's quite unassuming, I suppose, until the gadgets start, you know. Um, but yes, Terry Hatch has okay in it, slightly underused, I thought. Um, but the one thing that basically lets it down for me is uh, Elliot Carver. I really, you know, I just find him a bit of a weak villain. You know, the, the whole idea of, you know, starting a third world war to get newspaper sales. <laughs> Were you gonna get them delivered to bunkers? I just, no, I, I, that bit of it I don't like. The action's great, the music's great, the acting's great, and Pierce is great in it as well. It's just that one point, that the whole premise of the thing, you know, risking the whole world being destroyed, so you can cover it with your, you know, with your media empire. Um, I mean, you're gonna be destroyed as well, you know, so no. That, that was a bit too daft, I thought. But, you know, um, a good picture, a good picture. I'm just clicking to see the number of the next one because I'm getting tired now. And the next one is number 13. So, which one will that be? It is Dr. No. Great, absolutely great film, you know. Uh, fantastic. Um, I love everything about it. Uh, you know, it's as I say. It, you know, you've got to put them in some kind of order. You can't have everything being number one if you're trying to make a list of favourites. The only thing I'd say about Doctor No is it's 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 aged a lot now. Now that makes it quite charming, you know. But it does look very very dated, you know. Um, in fact, for 1962 for a 60s movie, I guess it was only 62, but it looks more like late 50s. Um, in the fashions and kind of the way it was filmed and stuff, you know, um, it's still fantastic. And and Jack Lord, I think, is probably uh, the best Felix Light of of the entire set of movies. Uh, I think he's absolutely great. Ursula and Urs oh, Ursula Andress is absolutely great. Um, actually, I, I was speaking on one of my other videos. I was saying that Nikki Vanderzil, um, she dubbed Ursula Andress in that movie. And she also dubbed Eunice, uh, Eunice Gason, who was um, Sylvia Trench again for the second time. Um, so, you know, the voices weren't all original, uh, but the girls in it were absolutely fantastic. Um, the locations, Jamaica and stuff, brilliant, absolutely lovely, you know, great to look at. And I thought Dr. No's bass was just superb. I mean, that really is iconic because it was the start of the kind of the Bond villainous basses, you know and not too over the top um there are bits where the film drags a little bit but the, the moments where connery's just being pure bond you know 
the talc on the attaché case and spreading the hair across the, the crack on the door to see if anybody's you know been in the room searching around the room and that type of stuff are brilliant you know um, but yes it's it's just a little bit slower moving with a little less action um, than a lot of them so for me uh, number 13 it sits round about the middle which is great I watch it quite often and uh, really enjoyed it so next number 12 Live and Let Die. Um, Roger's first outing as James Bond. Um, I think he hadn't, you know, it, it, it's it's a first Bond film. And all of the actors who play Bond on the first film, you know, maybe with the exception of Sean Connery, who had nothing to live up to, they all had some, you know, a previous Bond that they were going to follow on from, that they have to try and at least equal, if not better. Um, so he appears to be a little bit unsure in, the, in this movie. He doesn't feel it doesn't feel like he's quite relaxed in the role. However, he does a great job. It, it's a brilliant movie. Um, it's George Martin and Paul McCartney and Wings do a fantastic soundtrack to it as well. Um, it's a little bit. It, it it does look like a black exploitation movie for a, a lot of the film. You know, a lot of the stuff in in uh, Harlem and uh, you know. Um, was very much the film was made very much of the era when Shaft and Black Belt Jones and movies like that were coming out, you know, and you can kind of see that. Um, but it's really interesting. It, it, it's a good timepiece. It's it's a good um, example of, of how things were in America at that time. Uh, I really enjoy it. Everything about it. it it's I mean, it does have a drug storyline, but nowhere near as as intense. As License to Kill was later on about the, the drug stuff. Um, Yafford Cotto is fantastic. Um, and the other side characters like Whisper and Mr. T and that are great villains. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it, it, I love it. it it's, uh, it's a wonderful film. It's, strangely enough, it's not one I watch a massive amount. Um, and I think it's because it's just so memorable. Everything about it, you know, you, you can kind of, you know exactly what's happening. As a kid, I saw this maybe oh, I don't know six, seven times at the cinema, and then once we got the VHS time, um, over and over again on there, and I would still enjoy it today. So it, it, it's just a damn good uh, all-round Bond film. So next one, number eleven. Number eleven, Moonraker. Now, <laughs> a lot of people would have this right down the bottom because it's just so silly and daft. And it is, but a lot of thing things about the Bond movies is it, it's where your life was at the time that you saw them, and um, at the time I saw this, it was a really happy time of my life. I was, a, you know, at an age where I was just turned into an adult and just start to enjoy life and stuff, and uh, you know, it, it was just fun. I saw it at the cinema, and and that opening, that pre-credit sequence where Bond's threw it out of the plane. I mean, there was an absolute gasp, you know. Um, it was just brilliantly filmed, you know. I think they did 30, 38 times they took to the air to do that shot, which lasts just a couple of minutes, those shots, you know. Um, and obviously they had parachutes underneath their clothes. But it still doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, it, it was very dangerous and very exciting to watch. Um, loved that. Um, it was right about the time as well 1979 when it was Star Wars you know Star Wars Star was obviously was released in 77 um, and everything had to be about space science fiction you know you know even if you switch at that time if you switched on a quiz show uh, in the UK on a Saturday night there would be something about Star Wars there would be Star Wars questions or there would be some dancers would come on in, in the middle of the show dressed as Star Wars characters or something you know and everything was space laser Star Wars so for all it was crazy, um, and with all the laser stuff and the space station and all that, you know, the space shuttle stuff, it was just what was happening at that time. Um, and you kind of just accepted it. You went, you know, they've, they've gone with the, the science fiction route, you know, kind of thing. Although Cubbywood insisted it was science fact, you know, it was so far removed from fact it was ridiculous, you know. But it's action packed and I mean, it goes at a blistering pace. Um, there's some really silly bits with Jaws. I mean, that, that's just just too daft. But again, 
it was just Rogers films are like that you know they really were it, it was they were lift and bond at the time to, to be kind of much more light-hearted much more family based movies you know and I, I, you look back on them now and you've got to say well it's quite charming it, it's a time piece of, of what they were doing at the time you know so uh, yeah so I, I still enjoy it and I watch it quite a lot you know anyway we are going into the top 10 now and I think number 10 is going to be a surprise to a lot of people Yeah, I'm just looking around to see if I've got a hard hat here somewhere in case people start throwing things at the flat. Um, <laughs> Spectre, I know. A lot of people would say that would be my absolute bottom or maybe second bottom of the list, Spectre, because it's so, um, well, maligned, I guess, and, and, and so uh, badly liked. It, it's just, it doesn't sit well with a lot of people. I, I really like it. Um, I think it's because of the nostalgia of having Blofeld and the Spectre organisation back for the first time, you know, since uh, well, since the 60s. Um, you know, it's the, the, the last time that Blofeld was featured properly, I suppose, was actually it was 1971. It was Diamonds Are Forever. Um, but there wasn't so much a link to the Spectre thing then. It, it was just kind of Blofeld as if he was on the run, you know. Um, anyway, I like that. A lot of people say they didn't think the uh, the opening credit sequence, sorry, the, the pre-credit sequence was great. I thought it was fantastic. I thought the helicopter stunts were absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, I, I just, I like the whole thing of the, um, the Day of the Dead stuff, you know. And that music that plays right the way through that scene and Bond actually climbs out the window and walks down over the rooftops. Uh, it's just so stylish. I mean, Daniel Craig looks fantastic in that, you know. Another one, the car chase. People say, well, that's spoiled because he's actually on his phone to Money Penny while the car chase is happening. It didn't bother me at all. I, I found it equally as exciting as any other car chase, to be honest with you. And uh, the, the, the gags with the Aston not working properly, you know, not much being set up. Not for long. It has a couple of gadgets towards the end of that scene, which was great. Um, and the whole Blofeld thing, that obviously the, the major thing with this film is what people say about the stepbrothers and stuff. I, I don't see them. I really don't see it that the stepbrothers. I mean, you know, it's that the guy was his, his parent Bond's parents were killed, and uh, he, um, Oberhauser was looking after him for a couple of years. You know, Oberhauser in the book, uh, in one of the short stories. Uh, basically, uh, I think it's the, is it For Your Eyes Only? I'm not sure because I, I, it's so long since I've read the books. But one of the one of the um, compilations of, sh of short stories, uh, he do that does exactly happen. He lives with Oberhauser for a couple of years uh, when he's a young man who an Oberhauser teaches him to ski. But there's no mention of the son, you know. Uh, there's no mention of Franz Oberhauser who would go on to become Blofeld, you know. So they, they've took a kind of a small element of a story and, and developed on it and I really don't mind it you know people went up in arms about the whole thing but it didn't really bother me uh, to be honest with you I thought it was um, a good action film I just I really think it's a good fun action film and the fight with Hinks on the train is probably the best fight I've seen in a Bond film since uh, Red Grant fighting with Bond in From Russia With Love you know and I thought that was absolutely superb yes the end of the film feels a bit tacked on uh, the stuff with the old MI6 build and, and Bond shooting the helicopter down with just his PPK. I know, cheesy, I know, but I think the majority of the film's good and I really like it and I enjoy watching it. Um, I really do, so I can't help it. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, that's the number 10. Next, number 9. Cold and I. 1995 and we had waited so long for a new Bond film because of legal wrangling uh, with the film companies and producers and all that stuff which I won't go into you can read about it online uh, but it had been such a long time um, I remember I think six years I think it was uh, between License to Kill and, and Goldeneye that when it eventually came round I couldn't wait to get to the cinema to see it you know and uh, I thought Pierce Brosnan did a great job um, for his first Bond film. I thought it was absolutely excellent. A bit rough around the edges. He didn't look quite as um, 
physical a character as some of the other Bonds did, you know. Um, he was a lot slimmer and that, you know. Uh, but he actually, he beefed up for the next movie, for Tomorrow Never Dies. But in this one, you know, not so much. Uh, anyway, the story was great. Sean Bean, absolutely brilliant as uh, Alex Trevelyan. Um, fantastic start with the uh, the bungee jump at the dam. You know, that was just absolutely superb. I don't think they needed the plane going over the edge and then Bond flying off the bike and, you know, basically hurtling down and climbing inside the plane. Um, I think what the way that they should have done that very similar, but I think they should have just done it where the bike caught up with the plane and he climbed in the back of the plane through an open door, you know, got to the cockpit and still had to fight with the controls. That would have been enough, but, you know, never mind anyway, not to worry. Um, the girls are fantastic, particularly uh, Zida on the top for me. She's, Fam Jansen is just out of this world in this movie. She's great. She really is good. Um, and actually reminds me a bit of Barbara Carrera's character in Never Say Never Again, for all that's not an Eon Bond film, not an official one. You know, the the, 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 the characters are quite similar. Um, and the, the downside, the, you know, most people say the same as the soundtrack. The GoldenEye music, the GoldenEye theme is great. And some of the elements of... Um, Bond theme stuff with on timpani and stuff and uh, and that are really good as well. There's a few orchestral tracks that are good, but there are some really kind of jazz based, um, way out kind of funky stuff in it. That that's you know, no, <laughs> just the music is not great. You know, there's no doubt about that. But uh, the rest of the film, I think it's really excellent, and uh, that's why it's at number nine. Um, next number eight. Right, number eight, a real classic from Russia with Love. Uh, this movie is just absolutely the epitome of um, 60s spy films. I mean, it really is brilliant. It's very Hitchcockian. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of Hitchcock movies that are so similar to this film. Uh, you know, Fleming knew what he was doing when he wrote this kind of stuff. This was his best, you know. And, and I've read the book many times. It actually, it's quite similar to the book. There are a lot of extra bits added because, you know, um, after the success of Doctor No, you fade all the way through the Bond franchise. It just gets a little bit more and more and more as far as um, being a little bit way out goes, you know. So we had the attaché case in this one uh, with gadgets fitted to it, which weren't too outlandish, but uh, it was a little different. Um, the story all the way through is great. I would have it higher but it's just the pace you know you've got to be in the mood for for that movie because it's quite intense from Russia with Love and it, it moves quite slowly as well um, and if, if I really want to feel good factor Bond action film you know to get the blood pumping it's just a bit slow moving for that you know um, but everyone's great I mean Dan Daniela Bianchi is absolutely gorgeous she's fantastic in it um, uh, Karim Bey is one of my favorite uh, Bond characters. You know, he's absolutely brilliant as well. The music's damn fine all the way through. Plenty of action, you know. There's a lot to like, um, but just a little bit slow moving for me. So uh, for all it's um, an excellent film, that's why it's not uh, in the top five. So that was from Shows Love number eight. What happens next? Let's see what comes next. For your eyes only. Number seven, for your eyes only, 1981. And a more serious um, sight to Roger Moore in this one. Um, I think after Moonraker, most people agree that it's like, look, you know, this is, this is about as, as way out as we can take it. You know, it's, it's yes, it was a family entertainment movie, as I mentioned earlier, but the thing with Moonraker is it's just so out there, you know, with, with space battles and lasers and, you know, um, Obviously, the George character, George character himself, is absolutely crazy. You know, smashing through a cable car thing, and you'd still survive, and all that, all that kind of, you know, the craziness of Moonraker. If you've seen the Bond film, they thought we'll bring it down to earth a bit. Um, and for your eyes only, in the main, is a pretty serious movie. It's a good espionage film. I think it's personally, I think it's um, one of Roger's best performances. He acts it really well. Um, it's Topol's fantastic in it. He's absolutely great. I think he's marvellous. 
Uh, I think Carol Bouquet, Bouquet is a great Bond girl as well, absolutely stunning. Uh, the music's good. Bill Conti this time doing the soundtrack, and uh, it's one of my favourites. I think it's it's really good. Um, the theme's okay. The uh, Sheena Easton for your eyes only theme. It's all right. You know, it's not a favourite, but it's 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 all right. It's pleasant, I suppose, is is the term. You know, uh, but there's some great scenes. The the, the skiing. Um, scenes are absolutely fantastic in this movie and the climbing scenes are good as well the only thing with it is i find the last 15 20 minutes a bit of a letdown um it builds really well and there's a fun car chase and then there's the fun skiing chases you know um the climbing is is good you know that, that's it's quite breathtaking some of the mountain climbing stunts but the whole thing just kind of fizzles out you know um, one gangster kills the other gangster and the uh, the electronic equipment just gets kicked off the side of the mountain and that's an end to it it's kind of nobody wins so we all go home um, I suppose it was probably something that was happening in, in movies at the time that, that type of uh, slight like kind of spy espionage reality thing but uh, but yeah the end and no it, it wasn't very satisfying I didn't think um, on the whole though great film and I really enjoy watching it I really do um, next one, number six. 2006 Casino Royale, kind of a reboot for Bond, um, in the respect that here we'll have a story where he's just trying to get his um, his double O license to kill. Um, and it's great. I mean, the, the start in black and white, it was just a strange choice to film the, the actual kind of pre-credit pre sequence without a gun barrel um, in black and white it was what a strange idea but it works really really well um, and the alternative to having a gun barrel where he kind of turns and shoots after the fight uh, you know um, in the bathroom it, it's just brilliant I mean it works really well there's lots of other elements I like the way there's an Aston in it a DB5 but it isn't the Goldfinger DB5 he just happens to win a DB5 um, at poker, you know, uh, that's tremendous. Eva Green uh, as Vespa Lynn is just absolutely amazing in this film. Probably one of the best Bond girls, um, I would say, in, in my opinion. It's only my opinion. All of these things are just my opinion, but I think she's tremendous. Uh, fantastic soundtrack, David Arnold again, uh, but a different style to the ones he'd done with Brosnan. Um, great story, really gritty. Uh, there is some humour, not a massive amount of humour, but uh, there's fantastic stunts. I mean, absolutely brilliant stunts. And uh, all the way through, it keeps you gripped. The card games, I mean, you know, they managed to make these poker games really exciting to watch, you know. Um, and obviously, there's the famous torture scene, which was featured in the book, in the novel, Casino Royale, which makes you wince just thinking about it. Um, so on the whole, a great film. Um, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And uh, now we move on to the uh, the whole gubbins of my top five, basically. So um, let's see what happens. Number five, The Spy Who Loved Me. Yes, I know. It's one of the lighter ones. And you think, well, how can you put that ahead of Casino Royale when Casino Royale is such a brilliantly well-crafted movie and a great spy thriller and all the rest of it? Again... It comes back to when I was young. It's nostalgia and how I felt at the time. And after, I mean, you know, at the start of this, on number 23, I said, I really dislike the man with the golden gun, and that is absolutely true. I was kind of devastated <laughs> until the next movie came out, and it was quite a while between Man with the Golden Gun and The Spy Who Loved Me. But when The Spy Who Loved Me came out in 77, and you went and you saw that opening with the ski chase and the parachute, where he parachutes off the edge of the mountain and that, and just everything about how modern it felt in comparison, you know. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's the Lotus of Spray. Um, the underwater scenes are great too. Stromberg's uh, Atlantis is fantastic, you know. But it was just the whole feel of the thing felt fresh and new and modern. Whereas everything in Man with a Golden Gun had felt staid and crappy and, I don't know, just dull. Um, so I can still watch it now. It, it just makes me smile. It puts a smile on my face if I'm watching The Spy Who Loved Me, you know. I mean, the Aston car, the, the Aston, sorry. The Lotus car chase uh, with the helicopter chasing them and everything, I just love it, you know. It's, um, 
It's great, the girls are great. Barbara Bach is absolutely lovely. And Caroline, my, Caroline Munro is one of my favourite pin-up girls of all time. I mean, the Lambs Navy Rum girl, as well as star of many uh, Hammer Horror films and, uh, and lots of others. She's just tremendous. She really is good. And it's got a good ending, you know. Yes, the whole thing is kind of ripped off you of twice, except instead of um, pinching space capsules, the villain's pinching submarines in a giant tanker. So, And I know I said earlier you only live twice is, twice is just too daft. But I just, you know, some movies you just love and you can't help it, and this is one of them. So that was my number five, The Spy Who Loved Me. So next on to number four. The Living Daylights. Timothy Dalton's f first of two films, uh, 1987. Um, again, um, I did a short review for uh, The Bond Room on Unlocked, which is a, a fantastic YouTube channel, by the way, and they have a Facebook page too. So if you get the chance, you know, look them guys up and uh, have a watch of their stuff, fantastic. Um, and basically I was saying that, uh, you know, when, when I saw uh, a View to a Kill, which you'll remember, number 24 was Frank's the lowest on this list. Roger was far too old and he knew it. Uh, they changed pretty much the whole format for The Living Daylights. You know, it was much more aggressive, much less stunt doubles. Timothy Dalton, as much as he possibly could himself, uh, the music felt fresher, more modern. It's a great theme, The Living Daylights by Aha. Uh -huh. uh, unfortunately, it was the last collaboration with John Barry because he basically had enough. He'd had a little bit of a rough time with Duran Duran, apparently. Um, although I don't want Duran Duran's lawyer on the phone, it's just what I read. <laughs> um, but Aha was the final straw, they just couldn't work together. Which is a shame because the end result is absolutely tremendous. It's one of my favourite Bond CDs and I play it very often because I have all the soundtracks too. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. Um, Again, it, it's it's an espionage-based story, and it's great to see the return of the Aston Martin. You know, we'll have an Aston Martin vantage in it, um, all kitted out. I'm sure you've seen it. If not, you know, watch the movie. Um, and it's it's from start to finish, it's just a joyous film. The 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 stunts, hanging out of the back of the Hercules on a net full of opium bags, uh, is just you know, it's amazing. It really is some great stunt work. And uh, I look, I, there's very little I can say against the Living Daylights, to be honest. Um, uh, if anything, the villains, they're not quite as nasty as they could be. I think the, the best of them is probably Necros the Assassin. Um, I think he's my favourite of the villains in it. Um, other than that, great movie. Absolutely great. And we are now on to the top three. The world is not enough. Is that a surprise? I imagine it is because a lot of people don't rate this film too highly. I think it's wonderful, honestly. I think by his third film, um, Pierce is absolutely at the top of his game. He, he plays Bond perfectly through this. Uh, it's it's my pers of all the Bond movies, it's my personal favorite uh, pre-credit sequence, the Q boat, um, which obviously starts off with the, with the Swiss bankers and you know, he escapes with the money after a fight and you know and then he goes back to uh, MI6 headquarters and realizes it's it's a plot to kill uh, Electra King's father and stuff and it, it basically an explosion happens and a chase ensues with him in Q's boat the Q boat um, and it's up the River Thames and it's just wonderful the music and everything about it you know I was I remember I saw it at the cinema um, and the first time I saw it at the cinema was with, with friend Mark, who actually I mentioned earlier on, who was a big influence on me with the Bond movies. And, you know, all the way through, I thought, this is fantastic. But just to finish it off, if it had a couple of rockets and the, <laughs> the next thing you knew, he flicked the switch and this guy and fires two torpedoes off. Um, loved it. Absolutely loved it. I loved the whole movie. Uh, I think it's great. It has ski chases, you know. It's again, it's got a different BMW, a more sporty one, um, which has a few little gadgets, you know, uh, nowhere near as much as the gadgets in uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, but still interesting enough. Robbie Colt Coltrane uh, returns, uh, playing, reply, oh, playing, my, my tongue's totally tied, reprising his role uh, from Goldeneye. 
which was good. Uh, I think he's an excellent actor too. Um, and Sophie Marceau is just absolutely gorgeous. I mean, she's, you know, she's just stunning uh, all the way through. There's a good twist to her character. And just on the off chance that you haven't seen the movie, Paul, I've already given out loads of spoilers, then I won't go any further into that. You can watch the film because it's great. So that's my number three. Only two more to go. On the Majesty's Secret Service, uh, most people shorten it to OHMSS or just say Majesties, you know, quite often. This film is just absolutely superb. It's so stylish. That's a lot of the thing. It's, it's fantastically filmed. Beautiful cinematography, great music uh, all the way through. The theme is, I think, actually probably my favourite uh, of the Bond themes. Um, instrumental, as you know, but wonderful. Uh, love it a bit. Diana Rigg is just the best Bond girl. I think probably Eva Green's probably my second favourite uh, Bond girl. Uh, but Diana Rigg as Tracy is definitely number one. She's just absolutely awesome. Uh, I think Telly Savalas does a great Blofeld. Um, the ski chases, I know there's back projection and I don't like back projection, but it's just what was happening at the time. Um, you know, they didn't have the style of filament or the CGI or the quality of green screen that came later, you know, so that that's bad, but it, there's not too much of it. You know, that, that's one good thing. There's not too much of that. Um, and I just, I really can't fault the film. I, I mean, I love everything about it. it. It's, you know, everybody knows it has the sad ending and that, and that is such a shame, but it follows directly from the book. The, the, the film is so similar to the novel uh, in so many ways, you know? Um, and it, it, it was a great book and it's an absolutely fantastic film. There's nothing I can say against this film. That <laughs> really, honestly, nothing I don't like. Um, I just love it and that's why it's number two. So we've reached number one. Here we go. What? <laughs> There'll be a few people saying that. Thunderball. Um, I've just adored Thunderball since, you know, I was a kid. Uh, it was the second one I saw after I saw um, Diamonds Are Forever on its release. Uh, the next one I got to see was Thunderball. And that was it for me. I mean, it's just... It's the epitome of luxury. That's the thing with this film. It has elegance and style, and I mean, Connery looks absolutely wonderful in it. Uh, he really does look completely into the role. Um, he's, he's prime fitness. He's absolutely dressed to kill. Um, you know, there's only a small amount of the Aston at the start, but it's a nice little touch to see the Aston again, you know, and you see the bulletproof screen again, which is nice. Um, the story, people always have a go at it for being slow moving, but I like that because there's something about it that, that gives a real sense of mid 60s, you know, the, the, the coolness of mid 60s and the feel of the 60s, you know, in the UK, as well as obviously when they move off to uh, Bahamas and stuff, you know. And it was a time when, unless you had a lot of money, you didn't get to see places like Palmyra, you know, and. Uh, the archipelagos and the Bahamas and that kind of thing you know you, you wouldn't see that stuff even on documentaries people had black and white TVs and stuff you know, so you didn't see it in colour so it was so rich and gorgeous uh, to look at you know the whole thing was, was so well filmed and uh, you know the underwater scenes people see there's too many underwater scenes they were too slow uh, no I loved all of it I, I've always loved stuff filmed underwater since I was a little kid um, you know, the end battle, I think, is great. Sadly, the fight on board um, the Disco Volante at the end is, is, is badly done. There is far too much back projection for what's supposed to be going on outside the windows. There's far too much speeded up stuff, uh, which I don't like at all. And I think that is the low point of the film. But on saying that, that still doesn't stop it from being number one because I just, I could put this film on and watch it every single day and not get sick of it. You know, just the look of it, the feel of it. It's, you know, again, one of my favourite soundtracks. I love the theme Thunderball by Tom Jones. I thought it was really powerful. Um, probably second favourite to OHMSS as far as Bond themes go. Um, again, just like, OH, just like OHMSS, there's nothing bad I can say about this movie. 
if I had to say anything bad about it, it would be that back projection and speed it up bits at the end. Uh, but that doesn't spoil the movie for me. Uh, this has been fun. I've, I've loved doing this. I've enjoyed it. Um, I hope after seeing this, you don't think, right, I'm watching no more of his videos <laughs> because I don't agree with any of it. Because remember, even if your lists are entirely different to mine, great. You know, that that's the beauty of it. There's something in a Bond film for everyone. And everybody's going to enjoy different ones for different reasons. And probably have different, well, certainly have different lists. You know, great. It's, um... That's one of the good things about it. They're so varied. They're so different. They were made at such different times. Um, but something, something, something somebody said the other day was quite interesting. I thought that I'd never really thought about before. That all these Bond films, because of the, the length of the reign of our Queen, you know, um, were all made as if Bond was serving the same Queen. Which is, which is quite amazing when you think about it, to be honest, you know. Anyway... It's been fun doing this. Uh, I hope you watch um, the other videos that I do and the ones I've already made. Uh, thanks for watching 007 Gold. Um, I hope you can understand my accent. I always say this, but I, I am quite Geordie. And uh, I do mumble a bit, especially when I'm tired like now. Um, so I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you again soon. Cheers again. Bye-bye. <laughs>